Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. I want to thank Mr. Servideo for this opportunity. There was no need for him to get sick in order for me to speak, but I hope he's feeling better. He's not um, here with us today, but I know he's listening in. Hello, Jim. <laughs> and Glenda and Angela, lovely special music. Very happy to hear from you today. It's wonderful to see our young people singing God's praises here in our midst. It's a pleasure to be back with all of you. I love coming to Houston. We drove down yesterday in a torrential downpour, but that's why wipers have two speeds, and we put her on high speed and made it just fine. Well, I've got, I hope, a message that will appeal uh, to children of all ages today. And to begin with, I'd, I'd like to see a show of hands of those in this audience who were blessed when they were infants by a ceremony that we have come to call um, the blessing of little children. How many in this audience were blessed? Uh, now just turn around, keep those hands up, turn around and take a look at all of the hands. Now, my hand can't go up. My hand can't go up because um, when I uh, became interested in the church, I was too big to be picked up <laughs> by the local minister. And I, I, I reckon I'm still too big, but in other ways. But anyway, isn't that amazing how many of those here in the hall today were blessed as little children? And probably, for the most part, you don't remember that because you were so small. But the fruits of that blessing have been with you your whole life. And I hope all of you can look back and see that blessing that you've received. And you know, as you consider our audience today, how many generations do we have represented here? Three or four generations, perhaps, maybe more? And as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, God says our children are holy. They are set apart. They are able to connect with God in unique and marvelous and wonderful ways. And their childhoods are blessed. Their young adulthood, their adulthood, guardian angels, all of the things that we ask for when we bless little children go with you your whole life because really you are God's children. We are all God's children. And it is a beautiful thing to consider that generation after generation, the children of God have been blessed in that special ceremony and have experienced those blessings. Yes, Christ himself encouraged little children to come to him. He lifted them up in his arms, and he blessed them, proclaiming that of such is the kingdom of God. And this childlike attitude that prevails, and uh, I know that sitting in an audience of this size, if you are selective, you can find a seat behind a little child. And when you do, Make eye contact with that little child, whether they're sitting here in the audience or sitting in the Kroger grocery cart. What happens? Those eyes are glued to you, and that big smile comes, and if you stay in eye contact with them, uh, they'll keep turning. Even though that cart is moving, they'll turn their neck 180 degrees, and mother wonders, what on earth are they looking at? I would not give that guy a second look, but that little child <laughs> is right there connecting with you, innocently, kindly, lovingly interested in you and wanting to connect with you and smiling, maybe waving, maybe wiggling and getting all excited because someone is paying attention to them. A little child is a beautiful thing, if you will. <clears throat> 
a beautiful person, a, a beautiful experience, uh, and a wonderful thing to uh, in experience in that fashion. And this childlike attitude of innocence, trust, purity, untainted by the world, and the attitudes of our carnal minds and our carnal flesh that eventually begin to mold and shape us in ways that we don't want to be molded and shaped, as we heard in the sermonette, but unfortunately we are, and it's a battle we have to fight. But Christ, thankfully, recognized that attitude of little children. He pointed us to that, and the Father and Jesus Christ give us the power of the Holy Spirit to help us perpetuate that attitude of childlike innocence, trust, and faith. And you know, for our own children, from our young preteens to our older adults, with children and grandchildren of their own, what a blessing to have been brought up in a home with loving parents, committed to God's way of life, who brought you up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and had you blessed. Maybe a few weeks ago in this congregation or a few decades ago in another congregation long ago and far away. But that was done. Now think about the loving care of your heavenly Father who gave his only begotten Son to die for you and for me. Think about your older brother, Jesus Christ, who willingly gave his life and gave up his seat at the right hand of the Father and became flesh and dwelt among us. Think of all they have done to give you and to give me the gift of life. And not just this life in abundance and happiness and joy, but eternal life. Whether you are four or 44, I hope you will remember that day of blessing that you experienced, and I hope you can look back and remember the blessings that you have received over the course of that period of time, no matter what your age. Turn, please, to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. To the first commandment with promise, verse 12, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You know, all of us have parents. That's one thing we all have in common, don't we? Some have parents that are living. Uh, some of us uh, have parents who are now deceased. But no matter what the circumstance, we are all still able to honor our father and our mother because we carry their name. In fact, we carry their image. We carry their likeness. Uh, there are many people uh, in here who are related. And many of us uh, can look at children of our adult friends, and we can immediately identify who they are. Uh, for instance, I know a Trebig when I see one. <laughs> and I can see lots of them out here today. And it is a marvelous thing to realize how God made us in his image and after his likeness, and now he gives us the opportunity to procreate in a very similar fashion. Children are very important to God and to our elder brother, Jesus Christ, to our father and to our brother. And it's something I would like us all to consider this afternoon, for even if your parents are deceased or they are living, we all have an obligation still to honor them with our lives, our conduct, our words, our deeds. You carry their name and you carry their image and likeness. You look like them. And it's an obligation and responsibility, and it's an honor. And generations are represented, as I said, in this room. And when you look back at the number of generations that have lived and died down through the millennia, how many would that be? Well, I, I have no idea. 
hundreds, undoubtedly. And when you consider the beginning of the modern era of the Church of God in the 1930s, how many generations have become familiar with the truth of God and the calling of God and the commandments of God and God's way of life down through those years, those decades, those generations? Thousands, tens of thousands have become familiar have understood, have been drawn to God's way of life. Now, as we heard in the sermonette, uh, they're all not here. Uh, some have left. Uh, some are still barely connected, but we are all here. We are here together, and we have a heritage. We have something that is very valuable, that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And I'd like to examine that this afternoon. I'd like to talk about our heritage, our spiritual heritage as the children of God, as members of the body of Christ, as disciples of Jesus Christ, as sons of God, and if you will, sons and daughters of God. What are some lessons that we can and should learn from our family connection to our Creator, because I, I believe that one of the very most important ways for us to view God is as a loving Father, a loving Father. And I hope that all of us as fathers have been able to reflect that same kind of love and care and compassion and concern for our children that our loving Heavenly Father expressed for his son, and that he expresses for all of his children. It's remarkable to consider that connection and how it's been passed down and how God views generation after generation after generation as his potential sons, members of his family. For in reality, uh, what is Christ busy doing now? He said, what? I go to prepare a place for you. And what else did he say? In my father's house, in my father's house, there are many rooms, many rooms, many mansions. Think about it. Your father, my father, our father is preparing a place for all of us. Won't it be wonderful to go home? And you know our original parents, Adam and Eve, had a chance to live there. In fact, they were living there. They were living with God. He walked with them. He talked with them. He formed them out of the dust of the ground. He performed their marriage. They were living in the beauty and the peace of the Garden of Eden. But something went wrong. And something has continued to go wrong. And that family atmosphere was broken. And we haven't been able to get back into that, have we? And I'd like to begin this afternoon, and I was in hopes that we would be able to project some pictures that I have, but I can only try to portray them uh, with my words. I'll do the best that I can, but it's from a children's book entitled, Because I Love You, by Max Lucado, by uh, any chance, do any of you have that book, or have you heard of the book? Okay, we have uh, a few in here that have heard of the book. The illustrations are striking, and I wish that I could share those with you. But it is the story about a wise man who built a wonderful village for children to live in. It was a place of beauty, of love, and of peace. And the story revolves around this man's love, which was expressed in many ways, and that he treated uh, the children of the community which he built, the little village that he built, with love and compassion and concern. He sang with them, he played with them, he spent time with them, he was very concerned about them. 
and the village that he constructed for their benefit was protected by a wall. He lovingly spent a great deal of time building a wall around the perimeter of the village. And this wall was designed to protect the children from the savage beasts and the hidden pits that filled the dark forest that was on the other side of the wall. I think you begin to pick up the metaphor of the story, the children's story. Uh, it was, of course, uh, the Garden of Eden uh, that was built and designed, that was safe and secure, and beyond the wall that was built around that garden was another world, a different world, a world of danger, a world of unhappiness and suffering and sorrow. Shaddai is the name of the builder of the village, uh, the one who loved the children, and he encouraged the children to stay in the village that he made for them, where they would be safe. But he knew in his heart that at least one of them would try to leave the village. And it's interesting because when he built the wall, he left a hole in the wall. And, of course, it played into the story later on because Paladin, one of the children in the community, which happened to be the village's most curious child, announced to Shaddai that he had found a hole in the wall. And he told Shaddai that the hole was big enough for him to crawl through and he could get to the other side and he could see the forest. Well, Shaddai asked him how he found the hole, and he honestly confided that he was walking along the wall looking for a hole. He was looking for a hole, for he was curious, and he wanted to see the forest for himself. He didn't really want to take Shaddai's word for the nature of the world that was out there on the other side of that wall. He wanted to see for himself. He was curious. And Shaddai, of course, knew that day would come. And he warned Paladin when Paladin asked him about the hole in the wall, about the consequences of leaving the village for the forest. If you leave, Shaddai told Paladin, you will not find your way back. And he gave Paladin some wise advice. You were not made for the forest. Let your feet carry you to the many places you can go and not to the one place you can't. But what is the attractive force of that one place that you can't go? If there are a thousand toys in the room and you tell a child, you can't play with that toy and leave the room. You don't need a video camera to predict what's going to happen, do you? And it's the same with human nature, generally speaking. Well, Paladin asked Shaddai if he planned to fix or plug the hole in the wall. And Shaddai stated that the hole was there by design. He wanted the children to stay in the village because they wanted to, not because they had to. And of course, plugging the wall would change all that, wouldn't it? Talking about free moral agency and the ability to choose. So Paladin struggled with his conscience, and he finally crawled through the hole in the wall and into the forest. And at first, he just looked around, he halfway in the hole and halfway out, and then he crept all the way out, then he stood up, then he started to walk around and look around, and suddenly he saw and heard and experienced some things that frightened him. He turned around and tried to find his way back. He was looking for the hole, and the hole was not there. He cries out for Shaddai to rescue him, and of course, in the story, uh, the story ends with Shaddai coming uh, to rescue Paladin because he could not come back on his own. 
once you left, that you cannot find your way back. Well, that's a children's story. And yet, when you look at the parallels uh, between that story and our own story as the children of God, I'd like to keep that fresh in our minds, especially our younger people who are here today. I want you to really focus on your heavenly Father and his love and care and concern for you and the village that he created for you so long ago that is so different from the village in which you and I, all of us, are living today. And he wants to bring that village back. And he wants to bring us all back into the village. We cannot find our way back ourselves. And as children, young or old, we have been called, we have been chosen in many cases, and we have an opportunity to connect with God and prepare the way for that village to be restored and for people, God's people, God's children, to repopulate that village and to live where Adam and Eve lived at the very beginning in the sense of living in God's house as a part of God's family. That's our heritage. That's really part of the reason why we are all sitting here today. And when you saw all those hands go up, God has followed through on his promise, and those blessings and those little children who have now grown up are proof that God's word is sure, and he will fulfill his promise, and that village is going to be restored, and his kingdom is going to come. But as I mentioned, I want to look at the generational approach uh, to what that village is all about and what that kingdom is all about. And the illustrations of ancient Israel and what they went through are poignant and powerful in helping us understand the generational nature of the promises of God, the plan of God, the children of God, the family of God. It's all there in ancient Israel. Let's begin in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Once again, we keep in mind the concept of generations, children growing up to be adults and parents having their own children who grow up, become adults, have their own children, and on and on the cycle goes. Think about it. And then consider Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 2. Because here we are talking about the children of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who have now been brought together in an unlikely fashion, uh, all drawn together, a band of slaves out of the nation of Egypt, and God has brought them together, made them a nation, and drawn them out for his own purpose. He's taking them to the promised land. All of that is a type of that village that he wants to restore and bring all of his children into. And this was a physical type of what God's plan is for all of mankind. Israel, a type of all of mankind in the ultimate sense. Now notice here in verse 2, Know today, as God speaks to uh, Israel, Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. I'm not speaking to your children. I am speaking to you, adults. You saw the Red Sea open. You saw the plagues of Egypt. You saw what I did to bring you out of slavery. You witnessed it. You were alive and adult, and you saw it, and you know it. And I want you to convey this to your children. Verse 7. Your eyes have seen 
every great act of the Lord which he did. And many great acts were performed to draw Israel out of Egypt and bring them to the promised land. Verse 18, Therefore you shall lay up all these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And in uh, some cases, uh, the Jews and others have uh, made devices that uh, allow this to be literal. Uh, they tie something around their heads and uh, they have uh, the laws of God, the Ten Commandments, or what have you, uh, written on a small piece of wood or a block of some uh, substance or some kind, and it's tied there. Uh, it, it's not necessarily literal. What does God want? He wants his laws and commandments written in our hearts. That's what your parents want for you. And that's what you want for your children. That's what every generation of the people of God want for their children. That's what God wants. That's what he wanted from the beginning. He wants us to lay these words up in our hearts, in our souls, and bind them as a sign on our hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children. He's speaking to adults. The responsibility adults have to speak these things to children, but before they can teach them, they have to be so embedded in their lives that they're a part of their hands, they're between their eyes, they're in their hearts, it's a part of them. And they convey that to their children. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Uh, what else can you do? It doesn't say anything about Facebook or surfing the Internet, <laughs> but it is constant. It is all the time. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and the days of your children might be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of the heavens above the earth. In perpetuity, it was God's design from the very beginning. He didn't want us to live in this world. And he built a wall around the Garden of Eden. And once Adam and Eve left as a result of their sin, they could not come back because the gate was closed. The angelic beings were there with flaming swords to keep the way of the tree of life. And so it has been. For generations, and yet the restoration is coming, the promise is coming, and it was God's charge to the parents of Israelitish children who were a part of the Exodus to teach their children these things. And generation after generation was charged with that responsibility to show his greatness his power, his mighty arm of deliverance. Because you and I need deliverance today just as much as ancient Israel needed it in the midst of Egypt. And yet, I, I'm sure that we are for the most part unaware of that. I mean, we have Kroger, we have Walmart, we have, a I mean, we have so many things. Why do we need to be delivered? Well, maybe we got a bad burger at of Burger King, and we knew we should have gone to Whataburger because we're Texans. Are these, are these the biggest challenges we face? And do we as parents uh, become so complacent that we don't realize the difference between the village that Shaddai built for Paladin and the other children and the difference between that village, as I mentioned, and the forest that was outside of that wall. And what our children face every day. We can become complacent, almost indifferent, uh, to the other things that are going on in the world around us. We are still living in a blessed nation of abundance and plenty and relative peace, but that could end almost instantaneously, very suddenly. In fact, prophecy indicates that it will come suddenly. 
And we as parents have a definite obligation, generation after generation, to accomplish this with our children, for these are the children of God. In much the same way, spiritually speaking, they are God's children, that they are our children physically. He shares in that, Deuteronomy 5, verse 29, a verse we've read many times. You all know it by heart, I'm sure. God's lament about Israel, oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments. Now, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. It says that it might be well with them and their children and may I say and take liberty, and their children, and their children, and their children, how long? Forever, as long as children keep coming. That was God's design. That's his hope. That's his prayer. It still is. It still is. And that wall that was built around the village that Shaddai built for Paladin and the other children with the hole in it, what do you think that wall would be typing? What, what is it representative of? Well, probably what? The laws and commandments of God that are designed to do exactly what we just read about. The commandments that will enable us to see things go well with us and generations following us. That's what the wall is designed to do. That's what God's law is designed to do. Now, think about it this way, and there are lots of different metaphors that we could apply to the concept of this wall, but does a wall restrain you? Well, yes. It does, doesn't it? especially if you're short like me. But can a wall protect you? Well, yes, it can. Can a wall do both? Well, yes, it can. And sometimes I fear that we might tend to look at God's law as restrictive and restraining. But any loving father realizes the need to restrict and restrain and to protect. Is that not correct? Aren't both aspects positive in that way? Because as children, we need uh, to be restrained. I know I needed to be restrained when I was young, and I still need restraint. Thank God for my wife. <laughs> and you know how many of you can remember your school teachers. How many of you can remember your, can anybody remember your third grade teacher's name? All right, many of you did not get past the third grade. I can see that. <laughs> My third grade teacher's name was Mrs. Davis. And I can still see the house where she lived because it was across the street from one of my friends. Teachers in your life hold a special spot. And our young children in here, how many of you are in the third grade? How many of you are in the third? Do we have anybody in the third grade? Man, it seems like a break-off point for everybody. There we have a third grader. There we have a third grader. Do you know your teacher's name? The, that's good. You think you'll remember your teacher's name? Yes. And what about God's law? Well, it's a schoolmaster that brings us to Jesus. And when we, when I was in the third grade, I learned some things. Did I forget all those things? Did I reject my teacher? Can I not remember her? Is she still not a benefit to me and a memory to me? And where are the things that she taught me? Are they in a notebook buried in my attic? Or are they up here somewhere? And don't be afraid of someone bringing that script. Well, that, the law was just a a teacher to bring us to Christ, and now that we're here, out the window it goes. We don't need that anymore. Well, do you need that wall of protection? Do you need that wall of restraint in this world? Of course you do. Of course you do. 
Think about Israel. Now, when did God give them the law? You know, sometimes we, we have people that, of course, don't want to look back into the Old Testament because what can it teach New Testament Christians? After all, we're New Testament Christians. We, don't, we can't learn anything from that. Those old people and those old books. Now, what about the law? When was the law given to Israel? Was the law given to Israel before they left Egypt so that they could earn their release from bondage? Was that how it worked? And did God say, well, let's, let's see. You, okay, you, you kept enough of my commandments. Now I'm going to release you and bring you into the promise. No, no. The law came after God gave them, right, the gift of deliverance. That's when the law came. And to become perfect. And to obey the laws and commandments of God, yes, it's a command, but it's also a privilege. And it protects us, and it gives us an abundant life and an opportunity to enjoy blessings in this life and in the next. And Shaddai understood that. Paladin learned that. And that's, of course, a lesson that we uh, should all try to learn. Romans 8, verse 7. Romans 8, verse 7. A familiar memory verse again. This is the kind of mind that we as human beings have, and we have to deal with it. And it's not easy. Romans 8, verse 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Friction, tension, Resistance, question, sometimes rebellion, indifference. We just struggle with it at times uh, in our human nature. It's a part of our nature. And the whole idea is to transform our nature uh, to become that heart that we read about in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29, so that it would be well with us and our children forever. Oh, that there was such a heart in them. So the heart is a very important part of the Old Testament and the New Testament of God's Word and His plan. The heart is where it's at, and that's where your parents want God's laws and commandments to be, and that's what God wants for you and for all of mankind eventually. And that will become a reality when Christ returns and the kingdom of God is is restored to this earth, established. What a wonderful time it's going to be, and we have a chance as God's called out ones to be a part of the kingdom in embryo, as we've called it. And what a blessing that is. Yet, we have to realize that there's that natural tendency to resist that law. There's a natural tendency to go around the wall and look for that hole and crawl out and see what it's like because what does Shaddai know? You know, why can't I decide for myself? Why should I listen to somebody else who says it's not a good idea to go out there? And if you do, you won't find your way back and it's going to be worse than you could ever imagine because it is not God's world. It is Satan's world. And we have a chance to be called out of that world and live in a different world, and yet at the same time, not be of the world. We live in it, but we're not of it. And it's a challenge we all have to face, young or old. But thank God we have each other to encourage us, and thank God for his love in providing us with that protection and that restraint when necessary and the safety, and the love, and the compassion and concern for one another that we can all enjoy in this village, even here and now. And many of us have been together in this room, in this village, for many, many years. And what a comfort and what a joy to see these generations, to see these young ladies up here singing praises to God, maybe a little nervous, but they're up here.
and it's a wonderful thing, a marvelous thing. Now let's get back to generations. Let's consider what happened to the generation immediately following Adam and Eve. What did Cain do to Abel? Kind of sad, isn't it? It didn't take long. Cain was jealous. He killed his brother Abel. What about Eli's sons? What about Samuel's sons? How many stories can we tell from Scripture where the next generation had difficulty? What about David, a man after God's own heart? What did Absalom do? He led a military coup. He threw his father out. What a sad commentary on how this world uh, takes something good and wholesome. The laws and commandments of God, that wall, that protection, that restraint. And sometimes the wall is breached and people go out and they never come back and they have all kinds of problems and difficulties. That's why God said it's so important for generation after generation after generation to implant that law in the hand and between the eyes and in the heart and convey that to your children and keep the cycle going. And Satan wants to break that cycle and he wants generations to forget and not remember. And we must never forget the power of Satan to influence us in that way. Think about the nation of Israel, which later became two nations, both of which went into captivity. They didn't have the Spirit of God. The laws and commandments of God were not written in their heart. They refused to obey God virtually from the moment they left Egypt. And it was a challenge for God to kind of keep his cool and his patience with them. Eventually, they went into captivity because they turned to idolatry. They breached the wall. They went through the hole and they went out into the world, and they embraced all of the gods of the people around them, all of the ites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and whatever ite there was. They picked up on it, and they worshipped their gods right alongside the true God. It got so bad that there were uh, pagan idols in God's temple, and there were all kinds of unbelievably ungodly actions occurring in the temple that God identified as his house and indicative of his presence in the nation of Israel. A sad and shocking commentary on what happens when you go outside the wall and when you don't recognize what you have been given and when generations cannot instill within the next generation, that kind of respect, that kind of understanding, that kind of honoring of father and mother. And it speaks, of course, uh, to the nature of the world in which you and I are living right now. And even as the child's book stated, we can't find our way back on our own. We cannot. It's impossible. The carnal mind cannot find its way back. It takes divine intervention. It takes God's spirit. It takes a new heart. That's what the scripture says. I will put a heart of flesh, a soft heart. I will write my laws and commandments on their hearts. I will restrain our adversary. He will be no factor any longer. The world will be a different place. That village will take shape. And yet, he will still try to attack the village, won't he? But he's, in the long run, not going to be successful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All of us this afternoon, let's consider ourselves to be uh, descendants of Adam and Eve, or maybe Noah and his wife. We all came from Adam and Eve, generation after generation after generation after generation. And notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the important aspect of all the things that happened 
to ancient Israel. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. Your fathers and mine, ancient Israel, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, the manna that came from heaven, a type of the body of Jesus Christ, the bread of life. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. We go way back, way back, all of us. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You know, it, it shouldn't have taken them 40 years to walk from Egypt to Israel. Even in my decrepit condition, I could do it in a shorter period of time, I think. But they didn't want to go in. There were giants in the land. We want to go back. Uh, make us a god. We want to go back. Hey, a golden calf pops out of the fire. Here is your god, O Israel. We're going back. Think of the way that generations have treated our Heavenly Father. We don't want to repeat that. We want to maintain our connection, and we want to learn from Israel. With most of them, verse 5, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. And verse 11, most importantly, all of these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Paul was writing this first century A.D. The end of the ages hadn't come yet. In fact, it didn't come in his lifetime. It didn't come generation after generation after generation. And guess what? We're sitting here today, 21st century. It hasn't come yet. It's closer now than it was then. And is anyone in this room uh, filled with doubt about when the end is going to come? We don't know when, of course, but we can see conditions forming and developing. And how long will it take for the tenuous nature of this world's economy, this world's governments, this world's kingdoms to collapse? Not very long. Not very long. Regardless of when it happens, realize that all of those things that happened to Israel happened as an example for us to learn from. Generations separated from them. And God wants the same heart for us that he wanted for them. And he wants us as parents to deliver testimony to the power of God in our lives to our children so they can learn and they can appreciate the fact that God was at work in our lives as adults. God is speaking to the adult Israelites, not to their children. And he's telling them, you pass it along and you make sure they get it. That's our obligation, generation after generation, and that's our connection. In Matthew 16, and verse 18, Christ said he would build his church. He said he would build it. The gates of hell, the grave, will not prevail against it. So somewhere on earth, that church is being built right now. And we are a part of that. We are called a building. Notice in Ephesians 2. And young or old, our children set apart the blessing of the little children, the laying on of hands. We are all together in this building. Ephesians chapter 2. A beautiful metaphor in verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You know, how many of, this, of us in this room would have ever found ourselves here on Pearl Harbor Day? Is it December 7th? My watch is off. <laughs> How many would have found ourselves in this room by choice? I don't think so. It's phenomenal. 
when you think about it. And yet, we've been together for so long, it just seems like it's so natural. We're, we all know each other, but think about how you got here. And think about the sperm and the egg <laughs> that came together and brought you here. And your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, generation after generation, that linkage, that connection, God's love and his desire to build his church regardless of what happens around in that forest. He builds the wall, the village, and he wants his children to live there and to be happy and to multiply and to be fulfilled and safe. That's his desire. We are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. His house, his family, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's the foundation. That's the bedrock in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That's who we are. That's, that's who we represent. That's what we are. God's building, God's family, God's house, his dwelling place. What a beautiful picture. Lively stone built together, fitted, perfectly connected to one another. His dwelling place, built on a firm foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. Israel was called the same thing. His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who were once were not a people, excuse me, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. He is speaking to the first century generations of the church of God and the people of God, the 21st century people of God and the church of God. The word of God is timeless, and he is building, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it generation after generation after generation. We are part of something far bigger than ourselves alone, young and old. In 1 Corinthians 12, interesting, verse, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 18. This chapter speaks of the body metaphor. And we are different body parts, members, arms, hands, legs, feet, eyes, nose, all of us together, unity in diversity, and notice what it says here in verse 18. But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. This is the kind of care and attention and concern your loving Heavenly Father has for you and for me. He's placed us where he wants us. He has put us where he wants us to. To be. And hopefully we are happy with that. And we aren't looking for a chance to be in another place, uh, in another situation. We are content with the state in which we find ourselves. And we realize that God has placed us here. He's reached down through the generations. And he has chosen us. And he has placed us in his body where it pleased him. What an honor. And I hope that we as parents and as young people appreciate that and understand that. Let's look at the example of Timothy 
as related by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1, speaking once again of generations. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 2, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did. So he's looking back, generations back. He was Jewish, right? I look back, I serve the same God my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you, Timothy, in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, because he was compassionate toward Paul and the trial that he was in at that point, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance, what gave Paul great joy and satisfaction? He called to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, now your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is also in you. How many generations is that? Three. Three. It shows God works through families, through generations. Paul recognized that. It's quite a statement. It's quite a statement. Timothy's spiritual heritage... It's a part of our spiritual heritage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 2, Paul talks about heritage and generations in a little different way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2, If I am not an apostle to others, in other words, if other people don't recognize me as an apostle, as one that God has sent, Doubtless I am to you, Corinthians, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You are the fruit of the power of God living in me and exemplified through me and the words that I have given you and the lessons I have taught you, the letters I have written you. You are the evidence that God is here that God is working with you and with me. And when you look back at our heritage, we have a heritage where others have gone before us and they knew these things and they taught uh, these things to others and others taught them uh, to other people. And Paul's instruction was teach as you have been taught. Teach as you have been taught. That's what he wanted to achieve and accomplish in his life, and he wanted to achieve it and accomplish it in the life of Timothy and others whom he ordained to teach and to preach. It's quite a statement. And when you look back at what God did through Mr. Armstrong, 1930s, and from small beginnings came a lot of people connected to the truth of God and God's way of life. And that kind of heritage is ours to claim, that kind of understanding about our connection to the past. It doesn't stop there because God... And Jesus Christ are the same yesterday, today, and forever. They have simply perpetuated their construction of the church and their building of their family down through the ages, and they'll continue to do so. We are a part of a great mural, a great story, a great painting. It's going on. It's continuing. We are all together, generation after generation, and we can look back and we can see God working. And we should be able to look in our lives now and see that same evidence. You know, in addition to the gift of eternal life, 
when it comes down to it, what have each of us really earned? You know, sometimes we're accused of spending too much time and attention on the law. Well, uh, can we earn anything by keeping the law? Well, no, we can't earn salvation. Now, we have a reward that is coming, but we can't earn found, uh, uh, salvation. And what do we really deserve as a result of what we've done? Well, the wages of sin is death. But what has God given us? He's given us the foundation of truth. He's given us safety and protection. He's given us the knowledge of his plan for all of mankind through the Sabbath and the holy days. He's given us a stable worship environment. Yes, we've had our ups and downs, but we have a stable worship environment. As young people, you are surrounded by adults who work hard to make it that way every week serving tirelessly to provide every possible advantage for you, as in many cases, every possible advantage was provided for them when they were your age. Believe it or not, your parents were your age at one time. Even I was your age at one time. And we should remember those things. The sacrifices that so many have made, the love of your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, the love of your heavenly Father and our elder brother and Savior who gave his life, Jesus Christ. Love permeates that whole picture, that whole drawing, generation after generation after generation. That's your heritage. That is where you came from, and you know where you're going. As, his, as generations of recipients of these blessings, we should be displaying an attitude of perpetual gratitude. Now, I'd like to close by noting a few cautionary verses that the Scripture give us, gives us, and in fact that Christ himself in some instances gave to us, in order to remind us of our adversary's desire to lure us through that hole in the wall and bring us out of the village and the protection and the safety, the restraint and the parameters and protection and guidance that God's laws and his commandments give us for living our lives. Our adversary would like us to forget how we got here to forget our heritage and the source of the manifold spiritual and physical blessings that all of us enjoy and reject our heritage and look for that hole in the wall. Don't go there. Don't go there. Matthew 24. Christ's disciples wanted to know when he was coming back. He didn't answer them. He said, I really don't know later on, but what's the first thing he said to his disciples who inquired? Take heed, verse 4, Matthew 24, take heed that no one deceives you. Deception is going to become ever more prevalent in the world in which you and I live, the closer we come to the return of Jesus Christ. Deception is real. And that's what Satan wants to do. Draw us away through the hole in the wall. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Another memory verse. Test all things or prove all things in another translation and hold fast to that which is good. In our world today, uh, good is proclaimed as evil. Evil is proclaimed as good. Tolerance is the ultimate virtue. And God's laws and commandments are being ignored with unbelievable energy and determination to the point where uh, the laws of our land are established to go totally contrary to what God has commanded. 
We are living in a world that is changing rapidly. Uh, and it might look very enticing out there beyond the wall. And it does in many cases. But that's the way Satan designed it to look. It's a combination of good and evil. And he wants to make you believe and me believe that evil is good. And good is evil. And he's having a good deal of success, isn't he, in our modern day and time. In Revelation 3 and verse 11, hold fast that no man take your crown. Hang on. Revelation 3. Revelation 2 and 3, talking about the seven churches, several of which speak of the return of Jesus Christ in the context of the description of the warning to the seven churches. Hold fast to what you have, that no man take your crown. And there will be attempts to pull what you and I have away from us, that we have inherited generation after generation after generation by God's design. Don't let go. Hold fast. And Jude 3, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. Earnestly contend. Fight for it. Don't let it go. Don't ignore it. Don't neglect it. Don't limit its value. Don't disdain it. Ask God for the strength and the courage that you need. The same strength and courage that God encouraged Joshua to embrace as he prepared to enter the promised land. Now finally, in John chapter 14, I referred to this before, but I want to go there as we conclude. John 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, said Christ. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms, many offices, many responsibilities. The Father's house is big enough for everybody. If it were not so, I would have told you. He's not a liar. He's telling you the truth. I am going to prepare a place for you. For you. You. As we used to say, put your name there. <laughs> That's you. That's me. Generation after generation. Billions. He's got room for you. And he's going to leave the light on for you. Remember the old hotel commercial? Motel 6. Are they still around? I will only stay in a Motel 8. I'm not dropping to 6. <laughs> and if I go and prepare a place for you, which he's doing now, by the way, how much work would that be? Any of you ever built a house? Not by yourself, but even paying somebody else to build one, how much work is that? What a headache. What a migraine. How many have built a house and would never do it again because of all the headaches. Yeah, it just, you wonder if it's worth it. And then it's never right, is it? There's always, why do we put that wall there? I thought we were going to have three bathrooms. What happened to that third bathroom? God doesn't make those mistakes. He is preparing a place. And he, Christ went up there. He and his father are working together. He's coming back down that where he is, there we may be also. And in the long run, the father is going to dwell with us in a recreated universe, if you will, with the earth now as the center point. What a marvelous thing. We are going to live with our heavenly father. We're going to live in a village that encompasses the whole recreated earth. And there won't be an adversary there. There won't be any of the other things that draw us away and pull us down. Everything there will lift us up and point us to our Father, and we will be members of the family of God. We will live in our Father's house. I hope we long for home and look forward to the day of that glorious homecoming that really 
in a sense, has begun already here in us as God's people, but will begin in earnest upon Christ's return and the capstone at the close of the revealed knowledge that we have about what is going to happen in the future. We don't know anything beyond what happens after Revelation, the end of the book. But there's more to come. There's more to come. Of his kingdom and his government, there will be no end. And you and I will dwell in his house forever.